I want to ask you a question. How much time did you spend this week being afraid? I actually want you to pull out a mental spreadsheet and I want you to think about the times you were afraid. Now, you might be sitting there, especially, especially the fellows in the room. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of nothing. And I would agree with that. I'm like, hey, no, we, if there's a boogeyman in the woods, let's go get him. I'm, I'm fine with that. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the boogeyman in the woods, although for some of us, that might be what we were afraid of. The point is this. At some point, every single human being in this room spent time being afraid this week. Maybe it was when you opened up the spreadsheets, speaking of spreadsheets, of your budget or your bank account. Or you're thinking, how in the world is that going to work out? Maybe it was the time for the, for the big burly men in the room when your wife or, your, or, or someone in your family or somebody said something that made you think, how am I going to deal with that? How am I gonna, what can I say to that person to get them to stop thinking that way? Whatever it might be. And for those who, who are in this room and, and then maybe they were like, why won't he respond to what I'm asking him to do? Or maybe it's for some of you in this room where you're like, oh my goodness, I have a test tomorrow. Or maybe it's for things like I'm afraid of, like, wow, they're going to start framing the new church building tomorrow. wonder if they'll be able to get it done in time. wonder if they'll have all the wood that they need or if there'll be enough money to pay for it. Or what if, what if my sermon really is too long? You know, what if, what if, do you see what I'm saying? How much time did you spend being afraid? Because I'm going to bet that if you started to actually quantify it and actually think about how much, it was a lot more than any of us would be willing to admit to one another. And that's fine. You don't need to. I'm not advocating for that. I just want you to admit it to yourself so that we can start doing this. I want you to see that Fear is not from Jesus. It is not from God. And I know we have this strange dichotomy. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We talked about this a couple weeks ago when we were studying loving. And we were in 1 John chapter 1 where it says perfect love drives out fear. The fear of the Lord is looking at him and going, wow, he really is the God of the universe. That's all. Not actually being scared of him like he's going to actually going to come up with a reason to let the other shoe drop, right? That's what we all think. And that's because of these creatures that surround us in our daily lives. The powers and the principalities, the spiritual forces of the heavenly realms we've read about here today in Ephesians chapter 6. And it's in many other places in the scripture as we saw in Tim and John's powerful video. I want us to do three things today. We're going to clarify, we're going to identify, and we're going to fortify. That's what we're going to do. We're going to clarify, we're going to identify, and we're going to fortify. And the the beginning begins with Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, where the clarification process begins. And you got to watch out because it's Mark's literal version, MLV, right? And the reason is, is I wanted just to highlight a couple of key words that are sort of, you know, lost in the translation. The meaning is the same, but it's, these are words that we don't use a lot. And they're, 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 Look at what it says. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We saw that earlier. But it's against the rulers. These are the, the creatures that we saw that you go back and you look in places like Deuteronomy and others where Moses described that those rebels, those spiritual rebels, became the rulers of places like Egypt and Babylon and all of the different countries we can see throughout the Old Testament story, about the authorities. These are these creatures that run around trying to control and drive the nations of the world to ruin. I mean, some of us were alive during World War II or just that right after it. We understand what it looks like when they're let loose. Some of us were alive on 9-11, and we saw what it looks like when they're let loose. Others of us are growing up in a world after 9-11 and we don't necessarily see it, but yet we might see it at the shopping mall or the school when they're let loose. It was just bonkers, right? I mean, it just blows our mind. How can this be? How can we live in a world where people would want to go shoot kindergartners? We live in that world. And stop denying it. Stop allowing the world to deceive us that we don't. This is why we have to clarify. We live in a world where there are rulers and authorities and then against the cosmic power powers of this darkness, of this darkness, of the darkness that's, that we can feel, right? We know it's there. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We always think of heaven as a place that's white. It's got clouds and harps, right? That's not what the Bible describes it as. 
It is this other realm, this other set of realms even, if we allow the language to just say what it says. It's, it's, it's these places which we don't understand and we cannot see, but by which the scriptures testify to you and to me that they are real and that they are the true problem. This is what we actually struggle against. And, and I know, I know that I li- we live in a world where my language today just absolutely, in most places, if outside this room, would just be laughed at. And I just don't care. Because I understand the laughing and the snickering and the, the oh, Mark like, missed the Enlightenment. He's still back in the 1500s. And I'd be like, I take that as a compliment. But the idea here is that to understand that they may laugh at me and then they too will go home to a home filled with strife and bitterness and sadness and fear. And so my job is to stand here and to testify to you the truth of Jesus Christ that he came to take away our fears, to set us free from this bondage to sin and death, or as my Uncle Marty would say, to sin, death, and the power of the devil, which kind of is showing up on the screen right now. That's his language that he would use. And so it's this idea that the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, we need to recognize that those are active. And it's what we struggle against. Take a look at Ephesians 3, verses 10 and 11. We didn't read these, but this is part of this same story that Paul is telling us by the power of the Holy Spirit. God's intent, this is, this is literally, what he, like he's sitting there telling you, like this was the story, this was the plan all along. God's intent was that now, through the church, which makes it strange, oh, wait, what? Wait, what, what? Through the church, the manifold, which means many faceted, wisdom of God should be made known. And we always think it's just to the people who don't know Jesus, which I'm spending a lot of time always teaching us that we need to tell the people who don't know Jesus. But guess what we're also doing? Is we are making known the manifold wisdom of God, the many faceted truth of God, the wisdom, the knowledge, all of these things to the rulers, to the authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I have to tell you, I never understood an invocation. I went to seminary, I'm like, well, all I know is you're supposed to stand there and say, in the name of the Father and of the Son. And the Lord. I didn't know why we do it. This is why we do it. So I figured this out. I was like, wow. So I started asking questions. I was the seminary student that no one liked because I wanted to know why, where it all came from, right? And so eventually someone, just to shut Mark up, said, okay, read these things, study these things. You'll see where it came from. And this is why we say in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit because in this place, no devils can come. No spiritual forces in the heavenly realms can come in here and they need to hear us say it because that is the power of God displayed through the church, made known through the church. When, a, when two or three people gather, and, we, and maybe you don't say a specific invocation like I said in the name, but maybe you say, hey, let's have a prayer. Maybe you're meeting for coffee. Let's have a prayer. Did you know that at that point you are the church and this is happening? The manifold wisdom of God is being communicated and made known to the spiritual forces of evil because their rule, if I may quote, the Jedi Master Yoda, is at an end. Or actually, he would have said, at an end your rule is, right? That's what he would have said. So the idea, it's at an end. You know, and this is why I always connected to Star Wars, because I never, I, it captures this strive, strife against good and evil, the struggle against good and evil. But this, the silly thing about Star Wars is that it actually got it right. In this sense, this is what's going on. The difference is we don't have lightsabers and little green masters, but what we do have is the reality of people who are definitely under the influence of an evil empire. And we do have a savior, not from Tatooine, but from Nazareth, who is not susceptible to the dark side, but brings light and shines it everywhere he goes. And he shines it in you and in me, and through you and me. And he gives us power. This is why we have to clarify, what is the church? The church is the the force of God, the kingdom of God, marching on the earth marching on the earth, bringing hope, giving hope to people who do not have it. And by, by, by proxy, announcing to those rulers, it is over. Take a look at Colossians 2.13. We're going to look at 13 and 14. We said we're going to clar- excuse me, clarify. Now we're going to identify because you need to see where you are in this story. 
You and I are in this story. Look at what he says. God made you. Right off there, you're in the story. Someone I saw, I was on social media the other day, and somebody said, quit thinking the Bible is about you. (laughs) I agree what they were trying to say, the Bible is about God. But it's about God for you. Do you see what it actually says? I'm like, how about read it sometime? This, then you'll know what it's about. It's about God who made you alive in Christ, alive with Christ. He forgave us how many of our sins? Say it louder for the people in the back. All of our sins. He, he forgave all of our sins, and he canceled the written code. You're like, wait, what? What written code? You know the one with regulations, the thou's, the thou shalt's, and the thou shalt not's? Canceled. Not gone, canceled. Jesus fulfilled them. In other words, when you look at, you know, thou shalt not murder, and you're like, well, I never murdered anybody, and then Jesus comes along and says, yeah, well, when you talk, when you look at your brother with anger in your heart, you murdered him. And you're like, oops, I've already done that 17 times today. And when we think about that, we have no place to stand. So what, the first thing that had to happen was those rules and regulations had to be canceled because you and I were in bondage to them. And those certainly made us aware of our sin. We learned a couple weeks ago, the law makes us conscious of our sin. But what happens is, is and don't worry, don't, don't make a mistake, the law is not bad, it's good, but there, it, it, we can't do anything about it on our own. Jesus had to deal with it. So God made you and me alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, and what did he do with it? He nailed it to the cross. This is your first principle of prayer. First principle of prayer. When you and I go to pray, so often the feeling that will be in our heart is, I don't deserve to pray. I know that we don't, you know, we don't like to talk about that, but that is exactly the feeling that's in our heart. Because you might have just got done doing something that like, ooh, God didn't want to know anything about that. And I want us to involve God in it. I want us to involve God in everything that we do, even the good and even the bad and even the ugly. Involve him in it. Because it's not like he doesn't know that it's going, God doesn't gasp. I don't know if you ever knew that. He's like, God never does that. The church lady on Saturday Night Live does, but not God. Not God. The young kids are like, what church lady? What are you talking, anyway, that's okay. It's on YouTube, check it out. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Your first principle of prayer is identify who you are, who he is. Look at the cross. This is where God's love came down and set you and me free. Look at the cross. When you pray, look at the cross. And you're like, Mark, I don't have a cross. I don't care. Look at it. Think about the story. Think about what happened that day on the place, at the place called the skull, where the skull was overcome by a resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day after he died for you and for me. This is the power of the gospel, and it is the power which shines in a world that has only got death and destruction. And so take a look at the next verse, verse 15. Because we have to identify with Christ, with him, because that's who you and me are. We were united with him in his death and in his resurrection. After having disarmed the powers and the authorities, Paul writes, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he, that is Jesus, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. My Uncle Marty would always say it like this, you need to be a theologian of the cross. This is what he would say. And he says, everyone's a theologian. If you ask the question, who am I and where did I come from? That's theology. And so what you do is you do it by the cross because this is how God conquered evil. See, a lot of people will say to me, Mark, why doesn't God just get rid of all the evil? And then they create this little triangle called, you know, well, it's called a lot of different things, but it's basically this triangle which says, you know, God is, if God is all good, he cannot be all powerful because evil exists. And this is the conundrum that they will say. Proof that God is not real. Because if God is, if he is real, he isn't all good. Or he's not all powerful because evil exists. And yet the story of the Bible doesn't dodge that conundrum. It takes it full on, face on, face like flint toward Jerusalem, if you get that meaning from the old King James Version. And it takes it on full full throttle because here's what God says. Okay, yeah, I am all good. 
And yeah, I am all powerful. And certainly evil exists. But I'm not just going to get rid of all the evil because the evil is in my children. If I have to get rid of all the evil, then I have to get rid of my children. And I'm not going to do that. So what is he going to do? He's going to send his son. He's going to send his son to take the evil upon himself. The answer to that triangle is the cross. It is the place where justice and love come together once and for all for you and for me. And it is where we are set free from the powers and the authorities because they were, he made a public spectacle of them. I looked up the Greek word. What does that word mean? It means a public spectacle. It's one of those things, it's just like this absolute, it's like, here you go guys, sup. I mean, that's, I mean that's, a, that's a slight paraphrase, but that's exactly what it is. He's like, come at me, bro, because this is what I did. He triumphed over his enemies by the cross. Be a theologian of the cross. When you pray, your principle of prayer is to look at the cross. So that way, you're starting at the place where he gave you life. He took all your sin upon himself. He who knew no sin became sin so that you would become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Now, the after we have clarified who's the true enemy and we've identified where you and I are in the story, where he is in the story and our relationship with him, now it's time to fortify. This is, our, this is the armor of God from Ephesians 6, 14 to 18. Now what I've done is I've just sort of listed them there. And uh, when, in, when in doubt, I've, I've just copied and pasted exactly what it says. The first thing that is listed is the belt of truth. And we were talking about this last night at the grind um, because this was the text we studied at the grind over in Hollister last night. And um, what's really interesting is I love what Jeff said. He goes, well, it's the reason why truth's there is because everything hangs on it, right? And in John chapter eight, the people are just absolutely chewing Jesus out. They're just chewing him out. They've had it with him. They're calling him a Samaritan, which was a racial slur. In our time, we think good Samaritan, right? Not in their time. That was a racial slur. And they were calling him, who aren't we right in saying you are a Samaritan and demon possessed? And he said, well, actually, you guys are the ones who are struggling with that um, because you listen to your father, the devil. He is the father of lies, he, when he speaks and he lies, he is speaking his native language. Do you remember your spreadsheet? How much time you spent in fear this past week? How much time I spent in fear? Think about that spreadsheet. Was it like four hours, four days? How much time was it worrying about this, fretting about that, not sure about, wonder, wondering how this is all gonna work, whatever it might be, somewhere in there, the fear that you might have. And then I want you to think about how the liar and the father of lies would come and say, oh yeah, boy, you're right, this could get bad. And you know, I don't know if you ever noticed, I always used to remember when, when I was a little kid, we'd go over to um, f relative's house. And have you, have you ever done this where you go to a relative's house and everybody's sitting in the living room and they just start chewing the fat? You've ever done this, right? And, and where does it go? It goes politics and it goes you know, like weather and it, go, you know, it says everything's gonna be bad. Well, I heard it's gonna snow next week. 29 inches. I mean, like, you look at the forecast, there ain't nothing. But it's what we're talking about. We're worried about it. We're frustrated about it. This politician did that. That politician did the other thing. And all, what's missing from the whole conversation? Truth. When you look at your spreadsheet and you see how much fear there was, I want you to imagine the Lord Jesus Christ standing in front of you saying, why don't you give those things to me? You who are weary and and heavy burdened, heavy laden, and let, let me take those. And you take mine. I'll, I'll take yours, and you take mine. And what he gives you is truth. And you know what Jesus said in John 8? <laughs> the truth will set you free. Everything hangs on the truth. Put it on. A lot of people think, oh, that means I have to tell the truth. Well, sure it does. That's great. We love it if you tell the truth. But what if you don't? The truth still is you are forgiven. Your principle of prayer is the cross. Put on the truth. The truth is God loves you. He loves me and you and I are free. Look at number two, the breastplate of righteousness. We had to define righteousness a couple weeks ago because righteousness is a church word. We don't know what it means. It means everything the way it ought to be or maybe even always ought to have been. 
The idea is it's when it's right, it's when it's like, oh, that's the way it should be. And that is what he affixes upon our hearts when we put on the armor of God. His righteousness covers our own hearts. We were praying about this earlier. The Spirit intercedes for the saints, for our hearts, in our hearts with groans that words cannot express. That is the breastplate of righteousness. We need to have feet fitted with readiness for the gospel of peace. Readiness for the God. The gospel means the good news. What I'm trying to tell you right now this is the good news. That all those creatures, all those powers of darkness, the spiritual forces of evil, they do not have power over you. So go ahead and put on the gospel boots of peace and be ready. And maybe that means you just have a family member in your own house who needs to know that it's going to be okay. And maybe that means your neighbor down the street is having trouble and you need to help them with something specific. Maybe it means that somebody who just cuts you off in traffic, you just choose not to give them the one finger salute this time. Whatever it might be, put on those boots of peace, of the good news. The flaming arrows will come. You're a piece of crap. Something like that, right? And everyone's like, oh my gosh, did he say a bad word? And they're more upset about that than the fact that we have the shield of faith that extinguishes all of those flaming arrows. It extinguishes them all. It is the shield of faith. The thurion tes pastuos in Greek. The thurios was this shield that was big enough to cover your whole body and the Roman soldiers would put them together and they would form into like a tank, like a rolling shell, and they couldn't be stopped. Interesting metaphor. Take the helmet of salvation. This is the knowledge. This is the principle of prayer. The cross. This is where he saved you. You know it to be true. The wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God. Wield the sword of the Spirit. Go on offense. Um, The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. And the word for word there is the Greek word rhema. It is the outspoken word of God. If you turn to the book of Revelation, don't do it right now, but if you did, you could turn there and you would see Jesus depicted with a sword coming out of his mouth. It is the word of God. And it's a double-edged broadsword. This one here is the machaira. It's a shorter sword, but it's the still same concept. It's this idea that it is the word of God and it does stuff. May I just say to you the second principle of prayer. The first principle is look at the cross. The second principle is speak God's word out loud. Pray out loud. I know people will think you're weird. It happens to me all the time, but it's beautiful. And you know what will happen is they will stop thinking you're weird about 30 seconds and they might join in with you. Pray out loud. When you are home alone and you are scared, pray the word of God out loud. Read read John chapter three, verse 16 if you got to. Whatever's your favorite verse. For me, it would be like Romans chapter eight, which ends in the fact that nothing can separate us from the love love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I I, sometimes I shout that out in my backyard. And the demons and the powers of darkness have to flee. They have to flee. It It is the sword of the spirit. Pray at all times. In the Spirit, with every request. Pray at all times, in the Spirit, with every request. This is our core value here at Praise and Worship. We pray about everything. We were talking in Bible study about, you know, if you were to look in my prayer book, there's a whole lot of sickness in there. We pray a lot about sickness. And we're not going to stop praying about that. That's, that's one of the things we pray because it's, uh, guess what? It's one of the every requests, right? Um, and so it's appropriate to pray about that. But what I want us to do is to add to that more and more prayers about pushing back the darkness. What I want us to add to that book is the fact that when we see sickness, when we see people who are caught up in brokenness and in behaviors and situations and circumstances which entangle them and hurt them, that we would pray that those who are oppressing them would be vanquished, that we would see that those people are not our enemies, it's the spiritual forces of evil. That's what it means to pray in the spirit, to take God's word and apply it in the real world. And that's what we're going to do together as his people each day in this place and in any other place we gather And every time we gather, um, we're going to pray in the Spirit all the time with every kind of request. And right now, that's what we're going to do. Please join me in prayer. Father, we ask you for every heart that might hear these words that they would clarify, identify, and fortify. That we would put on the full armor of God, locked onto the fact that (laughs) 
we were brought into your fold the day, Jesus, you died on the cross for all of our sins, the day that you rose again to bring new life as the first fruits of the new creation. Help us grow in that truth and let that truth be on that belt which we wear that hang, all the other armor hangs on. Let us wield the sword of the Spirit and carry it forward, knowing that the Spirit will intercede on our behalf with groans that words cannot express. And let us keep looking at the cross and putting our trust in you, always being people that know the truth, the manifold wisdom of God, which is that you have decided to work through us and with us to bring your kingdom upon this earth, pushing back the spiritual forces of evil once and for all. We pray that they would indeed be pushed back in all of our lives as we pray in the mighty name of Jesus who lives and reigns with you, Father, one, and the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. For more information and for more audio and video content, visit www.branson.church.